This lesson is going to talk about the relationship between the area under a curve and the slope of a line at a point. And it's going to make a connection between the first part of calculus, the differential calculus, finding the derivative, and finding the area under the curve, the second part of calculus, integral calculus. And it's going to lead us to a very important theorem that's actually called the fundamental theorem of calculus. So a very big concept that connects differential calculus to integral calculus. So we're going to look at the diagram here. If I have these two points, a point here and a point here, and a curve that goes between them, and I make a little rectangle around them, well, the width of that rectangle would be delta x, the change in x, whatever this x was compared to whatever this x was, the difference between those x's. The height of that rectangle would be delta y, how much the y is changed. We can use this diagram to both find the slope of the line through those points and the area of the rectangle. To find the slope of the line, you would do your normal change in y over change in x, rise over run. So the slope of the line through those points will be rise over run, delta y over delta x. The area of that rectangle, base times height, would be delta y times delta x. So you can see that the slope of a line and the area of the rectangle are inverse operations. They have an inverse relationship. Well, what, these were all things you could have done back in your Algebra 1 course. But when we got to calculus, we applied the idea of limits to these two concepts. So as these two points, as the x values of these two points got closer and closer together, as those secant lines became smaller and smaller, the limit as the change in x went to zero, we found that to be the slope of the line or the curve at a point, the derivative. So finding slope by uh, change in y over change in x and delta y over delta x was the idea that we set with limits to come up with differentiation, finding derivatives. Area under the curve was found by taking the limit as these points got closer and closer together, as the rectangles got smaller and smaller. It would then become the area under the curve, the exact area under the curve. So we have an inverse relationship between differentiation and integration. Because we have that inverse relationship, when you want to find the slope of a line at a point, you want to derive the function. So if you want to find the area under the curve, the area of those rectangles, you're going to want to do the opposite, which is anti-derive. So anti-differentiation is going to be a key part of finding the area under curves, of definite integration. Fundamental theorem of calculus. When finding the slope of a graph at a point, you derive. Since there's an inverse relationship between the slope and the area, when you find the area under a graph, you anti-derive. And here is the fundamental theorem of calculus. The definite integral from a to b of f of x dx equals capital F of b minus capital F of a. So, what this is saying, the area under this curve, the area under f of x, between a and b, from here to here, on your x-axis, is found by taking capital F of b and capital F of a and subtracting those two values. Remember our notation. F of x is the function itself, the function you're finding the area under. Capital F is the antiderivative. So you take the antiderivative of this function, plug in your value at b, so you get a number. You do the same thing with the same antiderivative, plug in the value of a, you get a number, you subtract those two numbers, and that gives you your value of your definite integral, the area under that curve. We're going to do a very, very simple example. The process for this is always the same. The fundamental theorem of calculus is always the same. The problems may get tricky. They may be difficult to anti-derive. You may have to really work and learn some new methods for that. But the idea is the same. Capital F of B minus capital F of A.
So anti to I, plug in B and A, get the difference between them, and that will give you your area under your curve. So I want the depth of integral from 1 to 4 of 2x with respect to x. Meaning, what is the area under this curve, y equals 2x, between 1 and 4 on the x-axis? So we're going to do this two ways. We're going to go over graphing to see what this would be, like you learned in the last section. We learned what a definite integral was. Then we'll apply the fundamental theorem and see that you get the same value. So I graph y equals 2x. I graphed it from 0 to 4, but we only want the area between 1 and 4. So the area of this trapezoid. Well, to find the area of a trapezoid, average the bases times the height. 1 half, base 1 plus base 2. Remember, the bases are the parallel sides of the trapezoid. So these would be the bases of your trapezoid. At 1, the function's at 2. At 4, the function's at 8. So 1 half, 2 plus 8, average of the bases, times the height of the function, which is, in this case, the horizontal distance from 1 to 4 is 3. So 1 half times 10 is 5, times 3 is 15. The area of this region is 15, meaning the value of this definite integral is 15. Now we're going to apply the fundamental theorem. The integral from 1 to 4 of 2x with respect to x equals capital F of 4 minus capital F of 1, top minus bottom. So I first have to find capital F of x. Well, the anti derive 2x, that anti derives into x squared. So capital F of x equals x squared. You'll be asking yourself what happens to c. Don't worry about that right now. On the next slide, I'll show you why you don't consider c. We don't worry about c. We just get the antiderivative without the constant at the end. So I want capital F of 4. Well, 4 squared is 16. So capital F of 4 is 16. Capital F of 1. 1 squared is 1. 16 minus 1, 15. Same exact answer. Oh, this was a very simple example as far as how to graph, how to antiderive 2x. It gives you the, the method and the technique of solving these, of using the fundamental theorem. It's always the same. Anti-derived, value of B, minus value of A. Don't worry about C. If you have the integral from A to B of f of x dx, you get capital F of B minus capital F of A. Well, if we throw in a C on each of them, since capital F of x will be the same, C will be the same for each of them. So I would get capital F of B plus C whatever that C was again, minus capital F of A plus C. Well, when you subtract these two values, C minus this C, they go away. So the constant on the end does not affect the value of the area under the curve. Again, the process is always the same for most of these. But you have to be careful when it comes to an absolute value function. Because an absolute value function isn't really one function. It's technically two functions, or at least a piecewise function, that splits at the sharp turn, whether it be going down or be going up. So we'll give you this definite integral. Definite integral from 0 to 2, absolute value of 2x minus 1 with respect to x. Well, in order to graph an absolute value function, the first thing you want to do, find out when the inside equals 0. Absolute value of 2x minus 1, inside equals 0 when x is 1 half. So that's where your sharp turn is going to be. There's nothing out here subtracted outside of the absolute value symbols. So this is going to, your vertex of this is going to be at 1 half, 0. And then you see graphing this. You have a slope of 2 to the right negative 2 to the left. So we really have two graphs meeting at that sharp turn. The graph of this line going down, and then it turns into this line going up. Remember, the absolute value of 7 is 7. The absolute value of negative 7 is also 7. So we have two things to consider in an absolute value problem. The, the positive value, the absolute value of what it is, 
and then the negative value of that whole thing, that when you throw the absolute value signs around it, it will come out positive anyways. So I want to split this integral into two integrals. This whole integral gets split into two integrals. The integral from 0 to 1 half, because that's where it splits, and the integral from 1 half to 2, because it's going up that way from 1 half to 2. So it's the integral from 0 to 1 half. That happens to be my negative portion. So it's going to be negative 2x minus 1, negative whole thing. Plus the integral from 1 half to 2, positive 2x minus 1. So I don't do anything to that there, all with respect to x. This negative sign will go through and make it 2x, I'm sorry, negative 2x plus 1 here. Right side stays the same with the positives. Show you a little notation here. Uh, another type of notation. A lot of times, books or mathematicians or authors or teachers will write it out. They'll write the antiderivative. The first part. Negative 2x antiderives into negative x squared. 1 antiderives into x. And then they write the, the limits of integration on the top of a bracket. So this is going from 1 half to 0. 1 half is on the top of the bracket, 0 on the bottom of the bracket. Before they actually do all the math, they re derive and write this notation so they can see what they're plugging in to keep your work in order. And then you add positive x squared minus x from 1 half to 2. So you have those numbers on the outside of that bracket as well. Very common notation that you'll see and you'll probably want to use to keep your work organized. So if you do make a mistake, you can go back and check. So now, I plug in the value at 1 half in here. Negative 1 half squared is negative 1 fourth plus 1 half. So that's f of a, f of 1 half, minus capital F of b, f of 0. Well, 0 plus 0. So that's the first definite integral, the first part of this. Again, same thing over here. Plug in 2. 2 squared is 2, or I'm sorry, 2 squared is 4 minus 2. Plug in 1 half, 1 fourth minus 1 half. Subtract the difference. You do this math, you get uh, positive 1 fourth minus here, still positive 1 fourth. So you got positive 1 fourth plus 2 minus negative 1 fourth. So this is 1 quarter plus two and a quarter, so you end up getting two and a half or five halves. So again, with absolute value graphs, you must split at the sharp term, where it changes from one line to another line, or from one line to another line, depending on its, um, not concavity, but whether it's v or upside down. Common mistake that you want to avoid, a lot of students will try to integrate in the middle of the Interval. They'll set this from 0 to 1 and 1 to 2. Do not do that. It ha you have to split it at the sharp term, the value where the inside equals 0. So keep that in mind. Don't make that mistake. You don't split it in half. You split it where the function changes from one piece to the other piece. Another similar problem, just worded a little differently, but asking you the same thing. So you get a problem that you find the area of the region bounded by the graph of y equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 2, the x-axis, and the vertical lines x equals 0 and x equals 2. So your boundaries are this curve, this 2x squared curve, this parabola, the x-axis, so it's bounded above by this parabola, below by the x-axis, on the left by x equals 0, on the right by x equals 2. So you have part of a box with a parabola on the top, and that's your bounded region. And you want to find the area of that bounded region. Well, it's just asking you for the value of the definite integral. The area under this curve, between these two x values, 0 to 2 on the x-axis. So now you can use the fundamental theorem of calculus instead of using that limit definition with the summation. Anti-derive this function first. So capital F of x 
would be 2x to the third over 3. So 2 thirds x cubed. Minus 3x squared over 2. So minus 3 halves x squared. Plus 2x. Plus 2x from 0 to 2. Again, there's that notation. This one's a little easier to read because it's not as cluttered. Spread out a little more here. Again, plug 2 in. 2 cubed is 8 times 2 is 16 thirds. Minus 3, 3 halves times 4 is 12 halves, or is 6. Plus 2 times 2 is 4. So you get 16 thirds minus 6 plus 4. First part, that's f of a. I'm sorry, f of b. Minus f of a. We're plugging 0 is easy. 0, 0, 0 wipes out. So you're only going to be left with this part here. You have to make sure you take the top and the bottom and subtract them. This ends up turning into 10 thirds or 3 and a third. All right. Now we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to talk about what's called the mean value theorem for integrals. We talked about the mean value theorem back when we were doing differentiation, and that said that the slope of the tangent line had to equal the slope of the secant line. Somewhere on that interval, between those two points, is the only function was continuous and differentiable everywhere. Well, when you're talking about differentiation, your average slope is your slope of your secant line. When we're talking about integration, your average value is going to have to do with the size of a rectangle. It's going to have to do with a specific rectangle. Remember, differentiation has to do with slope of a line. Integration has to do with area of a rectangle. That's what we built all this calculus one from. We just applied limits to slope of a line, area of a rectangle. So now when we're talking about integrals, we're going to have an area of a rectangle that we're going to have to figure out. It says there exists a rectangle on the same interval with the exact same area as the area of the region under the curve. So if I had this curve here, and I took A and B as these vertical red lines, well, I have an area under this curve, all this area in here, some value. It's saying that there's a rectangle, the same exact width that I could make they would have the same area. And if you look, it'd probably be somewhere here in the middle. You have a little below and a little above. Cancel them both out somewhere in the middle, and you have a rectangle with the exact same area. One way to visualize this is if you imagine this is like a bowl or some kind of container. You have a bottom, you have your two sides, and imagine you shook it, and the curve was water. And you shook it, and you took a snapshot of the water while it was still moving. And the water level looked like this. It was high over here, it was low over here. The rectangle that you're looking for is going to be the same rectangle that happens if you leave that sitting on a table and it stays still and eventually it flattens out and stops moving. If this was water and you shook it up and then let it settle, when the water settles, that's going to be the rectangle that you're looking for. So we said area under the curve equals the area of a rectangle. So you can think of it like this. The area under the curve is the definite integral. The integral from a to b of f of x dx. The area of a rectangle is equal to the base of the rectangle times the height of the rectangle. So, to find the height of that rectangle, you have your function f of x, you know a and b, so you know you can get this. Using the fundamental theorem, you can get this value. You can find the exact area of the rectangle. To find the base of that rectangle, it's just the same base as that interval. So it's going to be b minus a, whatever that ends up being. If it was from 1 to 7, the base would be 7 minus 1 would be 6. If it was from 13 to 22, the base would be 9. Whatever that interval is, b minus a will give you the base of that rectangle that you're looking for. So the only thing you don't know is that height. In order to find that height, you take 1 over b minus a, meaning 1 over the width of that. So if it was 7 wide, it would be 1 7. If it was 10 wide, it would be 1 10. And you multiply that by the value of the definite integral. So if the area of this curve is 25, and this is going between a and b, let's say it was like 4 wide, 
Then you would take 25 and divide it by 4, multiply it by 1 fourth, and you would get the height of that rectangle, 6.25. The height of that rectangle is called the average value of the function. If they want average rate of change of a function, you're looking for slope of the secant line. If they want average value of a function, if a calc textbook or a test or an instructor uses the phrase average value of the function, they're looking for that height of the rectangle. Think about it. The function's here, it's moving up, it's moving down. But on average, over that interval, maybe below some points, above other points, but on average, it was right in here. Average value is the height of the rectangle over the course of an interval. The mean value theorem for integrals states, and this is the formal mean value theorem now, if f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, then there exists a number c in the closed interval a to b such that, so long as you have a continuous function, no breaks in the function, that means that there is a rectangle with the same area as the area under that curve. It says there exists a number C such that the definite integral, the area under the curve, equals B minus A, the width, times F of C, that height. This C is some X value in between. So if you have this picture here, you have the area of the curves in this greenish color. You make your rectangle, the water settles, it comes down over here, it goes up over here, your water settles, this is the height of your rectangle. C is wherever the function equals the height of that rectangle. So the function equals it right here. And actually, in this case, you would have two values that satisfy that condition right over here. You see the function would also equal that height. So the C is the x value where it happens. F of C is the average value. F of C is the height. Average value is looking for the height. If they say find the average value, they're looking for the y value, the height. If they say find the value of c guaranteed by the mean value theorem, then you're going to have an extra step to do. You're going to have to find out what that height is, then find out where the function itself equals that height. And finally, we'll do one problem with an average value. It says find the average value of f of x equals 3x cubed minus 2x on the interval 1 to 4. So find the average height of that function. It's going to be a parabola between 1 and 4. The first thing you want to do, remember, area to the curve equals area of the rectangle. So area to the curve equals base times height. First thing, find area under the curve using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I'm going to integrate from 1 to 4, 3x squared minus 2x with respect to x. This works out very nicely for integration. 3x squared goes to x cubed. 2x goes to x squared, so I have x cubed minus x squared from 1 to 4. 4 cubed is 64, 4 squared is 16, 64 minus 16 is 48. So I got f of 4 is 48, 1 cubed is 1, minus 1 squared is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So I got 48 minus 0, so the area under this curve, 3x squared minus 2x between 1 and 4 on that interval is 48. First thing you do, find the area under the curve. Now, to find the height of that rectangle, to find that average value, area equals base times height. Area equals base times height, so if you want the height, divide by the base. Well, the interval 1 to 4, the base would be 3y. So you take 48 divided by 3, and your average value for this problem is 16. Formally, if you're the type of person that likes to use the formula and work with that, well, you get 1 over b minus a. 1 over 4 minus 1, so you get 1 third out front of the value of the definite integral from 1 to 4 of f of x with respect to x. So you get 1 third times 48, which is also 16. I think it makes more sense to understand it better if you think of it as area of the rectangle equals base times height. I'm sorry, area under the curve equals area of the rectangle, area under the curve equals base times height. 
Area under the curve is found by the definite integral, so you use that to find a value, then you divide by that width, divide by that base.